Thanks a lot, Jody. It's an honor to be here tonight. Well, at Convoy of Hope, we've been helping victims of catastrophe for over 20 years. And we started small but gained momentum, creating a global supply chain that enables us to move huge amounts of food, water, and emergency supplies, things like tarps and tents, disinfectant, water filters, and more. At some point, we realized that Convoy wasn't doing anything in the way of medicine, and the need was great. We were meeting people with a wide range of illnesses, everything from diabetes and hypertension to cholera and cardiovascular disease, with no ability to serve them. And so we began praying that God would give us a partner to complete that piece of the puzzle. And the answer to that prayer was MAP International. Sometimes, as you've heard, we operate in conflict zones. And when it comes to disaster relief, getting the job done is a lot like being in a battle. When lives hang in the balance, you need someone that's in the next foxhole that you can depend on, a reliable partner who won't let you down when times get tough, because you have to work together or people will die. For everyone at Convoy of Hope, MAP International is exactly that partner. Providing medicine for the world is a very, very important calling. MAP has been a godsend, not only to us, but to those we help. My job with Convoy on the disaster services team is one of the most unique and crazy jobs this life has to offer. What I love most about it is the incredible and rare blend of compassion ministry mixed with disasters. Through compassion ministry, real and legitimate physical needs are met and people see the heart of Christ in our actions. Let me give you just one example. In 2015, a small congregation in southern Myanmar turned its attention toward a group of villages scattered along a large riverine island. The island, around an hour's drive from the church, was governed by a hardline Buddhist monk who strictly forbade Christians and foreigners from setting foot on the island of nearly a thousand families. But the local church decided to pray for the people on the island, and they did exactly that for three years. Fast forward to 2018, the monsoon season brought record rainfall in Southeast Asia. In Myanmar, over 200,000 people were displaced from their homes during the heaviest months of rain. Thousands of homes and hundreds of lives were lost. When word reached the church that the island they had spent the last three years praying for was under six to 10 feet of water, they realized that their compassion could be put to action. Now the International Disaster Relief Team from Convoy of Hope had already been in contact with partners on the ground in Myanmar. We had learned of the situation on the island and the church's desire to help. Less than a week later, the church was granted permission by the monk to visit with relief supplies. Two of us from the International Disaster Team accompanied the pastor and his congregation on the long boat ride, very long boat ride, through the floodwaters to the island shore. We were greeted with great joy. While the church members and their pastor distributed relief supplies and began to build relationships with the people, the two of us Caucasian men from Convoy of Hope became something of a great curiosity. This was the first time in local memory that a foreigner had set foot on this island. Several villagers asked the church's pastor if we were the light-skinned gods from a Burmese folk religion. <laughs> While we were obviously not divine, the joy and friendship which bloomed that day made it clear that God's presence had indeed come to the island. The entry point the church had been praying for came through tragedy, but led to great joy. Since that first rainy day on the island, the church has returned several times with supplies and smiles. They adopted a widow who lost her home and her husband to the flood, committing to rebuilding her house and supporting her as long as necessary. During this time, the church members have learned names, shaken hands, and become a welcome part of the island community. The great compassion demonstrated by the Christians piqued the curiosity of the monk and his village so much that the monk extended an invitation to return at Christmas time and share the story of Jesus. 
Because of the church's persistence in prayer and their vision to see the compassion, to see compassion as part of the way they live out their faith, the story of Jesus and the hope of Christianity has come to this island. Today, if you ask the monk or the islanders whether the island is open to visitors, the answer is no. No, that is except for one small church group and a few foreigners from Convoy of Hope to whom their gates and their hearts have been opened for good. We never know how God will work, but we see his presence so often in disasters. When people are in need of the basic necessities, and are especially in need of hope. Convoy of Hope has been able to grow exponentially, in large part because a partner like MAP is growing right alongside us. As our numbers continue to climb and we serve millions of people every year, MAP has grown in capacity equal to ours. But it's not only their capacity, it's their passion. In a world where people say, leave a message, MAP says, how can we help? They're always supportive. And in addition to that, I'll go one step further and say that it's the pursuit of excellence that MAP embodies that we respect so much. When Convoy picks up product at MAP, it is absolutely perfect in both appearance and accuracy. That attention to detail extends to the public sphere because MAP isn't interested in sending an annual report to donors that just looks good. They want to send a report that has integrity and reflects the fact that they do what they say they're going to do. When MAP, what sets MAP's MAP apart from a lot of other organizations is this simple but emotional truth. They feel the need. This is not a job for them, just something to earn a paycheck. They're about meeting felt needs. So when we're in a disaster responding, we know that MAP is right there with us. At Convoy of Hope, we love working with MAP International. In MAP, we found a group just as passionate about meeting human need and saving lives as we are. We share an abiding commitment to make the world a better place. The medicines and health supplies Convoy of Hope receives from MAP make a profound and positive difference in the lives of people all over the world, and we are so grateful to be partners in this ministry. And now we're going to watch a video to tell you a bit more. Moi pas dans le travail. Mon terre était la caille moi. Mon tap fait travail. Haiti, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, has been hit by a major earthquake. On y a pas d'homme devant faire du temps. On garde moi et mon gars en poule. Comme si me dit ça qu'a passé comme ça. Même pas senti vraiment goût de goût de goût de jamon. The quake measured seven on the Richter scale, and causing widespread and heavy damage. Quel couloir là pour entrer dans Champ Marissa et puis béton en l'air tomber sur moi. Lem le béton a fin fin j'ai été tombé, mais lem vin lem vin prend connaissance moi. T'as prié bon Dieu. Venez dans une machine Lovichal avec Tony, avec Julia. C'est grave, les bagages sont comme. Et puis bon, parce que je te dis ça, je te dis que j'ai fait qu'il était entré dans le pied. On l'a tenu en bataille. C'est le premier bagage qui arrive. Attention, il y a pas l'aim. Il peut essayer de gagner force moi. Parce que me tomber en public devant tout le monde. Et moi c'est Pierre Mbagayan qui fait me tomber. Mais on sent tout mal parce que on peut pas guérir. Et en côté donc médicaments, c'est plus gros bien que le décap fait. Et puis moi prier parce que me toujours prier bon Dieu. On va te souffrir pour médicament. Et moi était quand vendre dans pharmacie, il y a un pile médicament que me t'ai toujours dit me pas jamais prendre parce que c'est drogue. 
les mêmes gars des dossiers, ouais, qui en pile là des gens qui me prennent, ils ont été très chers. Merci en pile. Quel que soit mon qui capable écrit, m'apprécie ça et m'a demandé m'a pour toujours gain courage. Même là, c'est pas pour moi, mais tout l'autre monde ferait ce mieux à joindre. Écrit livre, gain mon qui capable faire disquette, gain mon qui capable passer le long. Tant qu'on fait tout dans le journal. Bon, les médicaments ont joué un peu de rôle parce que. Il y a toujours. Il y a tout le même, toute force, tout le courage, tout ça pour s'aider. Pour nous-mêmes, capables de bénéficier, même les nous pas vraiment connaissons, nous pas qu'à dire tout merci, nous ne Même pas vraiment connaissons comment je peux l'utiliser. Parce que bien plus le monde qui t'a remis là, je dis, elle va là. Il est mort depuis 2 janvier, il est mort après. Je dis au merci, en pile, à tout le monde, tout le sponsor nous, qui, qui fait jusqu'à présent, nous avons vivre, spécialement moi pour les médicaments. Parce que c'est juste moi qui bâti le pays, ça y même les nous pas vraiment connaît nous, nous pas qu'à dire tout merci nous qu'à entourer mais nous content avec eux que nous content Dieu merci I have the distinct pleasure of introducing to you our keynote speaker this evening. Uh, I am so humbled and honored to introduce to you this uh, Dr. William Fagey, who is truly a giant amongst giants in the global health field. I met with Dr. Fagey and his lovely wife, and um, Paul, I'm so glad you're here, so, and, so thank you for being here, and his son, um, uh, grandson Max, a uh, number of times through the last three years, and to me, uh, this is why he's such a special person, and he's, he, if you look at the internet, he, he's got long, long pages of all the things he has accomplished. Dr. Fagey is credited as having saved more lives in the history. Literally 300 million people died of, from smallpox during the 20th century before this horrific disease was eradicated. Uh, you will get a very special gift tonight, a signed copy of his book, House on Fire, and it's a wonderful story of his life, but also how uh, he was leading the effort to eradicate smallpox from the face of the earth. Dr. Fagey is a strong proponent of disease eradication and control. He has broadened public awareness of childhood and diseases and championing global health as important issues in the US and around the world. Before Dr. Fagey got involved, it was not cool or sexy to, to be in public health, and now it is. <laughs> Every university, so many places, global health is, and it's such a big thing because it's truly saving millions of people's lives. In the past, Dr. Fagey has headed up the CDC, Task Force for Global Health, and currently is a senior advisor at the Gates Foundation. And Doc, uh, Bill Gates will tell you, he has learned all he knows about global health with Dr. Bill Fagey. And there's a number of videos, you, you can uh, see his interviews with him. Dr. Fege was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2012, the highest honor given to civilian by President Obama. On a personal note, even though Dr. Fege is very busy and professionally and so many other things, he has time to homeschool his granddaughter, Ella. How cool is that to say, hey, my, grand, my home I'm homeschooled by uh, Bill Fege, you know, it's my granddad, that's, that's really cool. In honor of Dr. Fege's numerous and contribution to global health. The annual Bill Fagey Global Health Award was established in Atlanta in June of 2017. Rotary International and the Gates Foundation was the awardee's first recipient at the inaugural event for their fight against polio. President Jimmy Carter and Mrs. Carter were last year's recipient. And President Carter told us he doesn't normally accept awards, 
but because it was coming from Dr. Bill Figge, he said I will accept it, and he was there personally to accept that last year. It was such a thrill uh, for Dr. Figge uh, to be as, uh, the driver of this, because if it wasn't Dr. Figge, President Carter would not have accepted it. He came to visit us last year, such a, uh, to at MAP. It was a, such a joyous occasion. Dr. Figge was instrumental in leveraging the innovation of smallpox eradication to leveraging that to how to get rid of polio, the same uh, strategies. And he brought together the Rotary International, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the World Health Organization, WHO, to help eradicate polio. And we're this close, literally, three countries, Nigeria, uh, Pakistan, and Afghanistan, are the only countries that polio is remaining. And Dr. Fagy's work in smallpox eradication helped to really uh, drive that forward. So it is my distinct pleasure and honor to have Dr. Fagy with us this weekend. So please welcome Dr. Bill Fagy. Thanks, Steve. It's been uh, a very interesting time here to uh, see the connections I have with people that are here. Elizabeth's father was our lawyer many years ago in Atlanta, and Janet and I shared a mentor, and so there are so many here that I find that we shared experiences. You've heard that MAP is doing exemplary work. Well, Schweitzer once said to a group of students, I don't know what you're going to do, but I can tell you those of you who will find satisfaction in life are those who have learned how to serve, and MAP has learned how to serve. Will Durant once defined immortality as the absorption of one's soul in deathless acts, and that's what MAP does every day. Last week I was at the Smithsonian in uh, Washington, D.C., where they had a program on philanthropy and health. And uh, David Rubenstein was the MC at one point, and he said to the people that they were trying to interest in health giving, there's a special place in heaven for people who contribute to health projects. So someone asked, do you have any proof of that? <laughs> and he said, no. But you really want to take a chance that I'm wrong? <laughs> and I told them a story that I've used for some years, a true story. I used to be on the board of my college. And at one of the meetings, the president of the faculty said it was his last meeting because uh, a new president had now been elected. He said, I did this job because I felt obligated to. And then I found out I liked it. And I liked it so much, I asked my wife the other night, would you in your wildest dreams have believed that I would like something like this? And she said, honey, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but you've never figured in my wildest dreams. <laughs> well, one of my wildest dreams is to see global health equity. At the Gates Foundation, we used to talk about this. Three words, you can't take any of those three words away, but you can add 200 and it doesn't help at all. Global health equity is a worthy goal. The global health et et equity is really a Good Samaritan story, isn't it? I mean, I grew up with the Good Samaritan story and it would often end with the teacher in Sunday school asking, who's your neighbor, and you'd end up talking about people in other countries or other cultures. Never once growing up did I hear someone say, your neighbors are also every person who will ever be born in the future. And once you understand neighbor that way, then you understand what prevention is all about. Second, why should you have optimism about investing in global health? Well, Steve mentioned 300 million people had smallpox in the last century, died of smallpox in the last century. Another 300 million were scarred for life. And if you read the history of Europe, it's just amazing to me. Voltaire had smallpox. Mozart had smallpox. 
Louis XV died of smallpox. And Voltaire once estimated 30% of everyone born in Europe will have smallpox. A third of them will die, a third will be scarred for life, and only a third will get away scot-free. And now no one has to worry about that. Measles, when I started in global health, we were losing three million children a year just to measles. And if you can imagine three million couples now having an empty place at dinner, and then the next year, three million more, three million more. That number went from three million to two million to one million, and it's now down to about 100,000. It's still too many, but you can see that there's been great progress. There's a reason for hope. River blindness used to blind villages most people, by the time they were 50 or 55, in many parts of Africa, and because the Merck Drug Company became involved in philanthropy, that disease is almost eliminated in Africa. We now think it might, might be eradicated in the future. Steve mentioned this morning six million children who die each year under the age of five. When I started in global health, that figure was 15 million. Six million sounds Terrible, and it is, but think of 15 million just a few years ago. And these changes are all due to philanthropy, people investing in health programs. Third, we'll always try to make adequate decisions with inadequate information. And we're getting better at doing that. We're not great as yet, but we're getting better. There's some lessons that I've learned over the last 60 years. First, this truly is a cause and effect world. Stephen Hawking said that that's the history of science, the gradual real, realization things do not happen in an arbitrary way. It's cause and effect. Another thing we've learned is good things don't happen unless you plan to have them happen. A third thing, know the truth. Sometimes we simply don't want to know the, the truth, but if you're going to change things, you have to know the truth. Another thing, Norman Cousins, back in 1976, writing about the bicentennial, asked the question, what's the number one gift the United States has given the world? And his conclusion was, the number one gift is we've shown the world it's possible to plan a rational future. It's possible to plan a rational health future for the world. We've also learned that nothing gets done without a coalition. MAP is one huge coalition. And Gandhi said we should seek interdependence with the same zeal that we seek self-reliance. And then he added, it's the only thing that works because none of us can really be self-reliant. Everything we do depends on so many other people. And with coalitions, since everything has to be done with a coalition, the question is, what distinguishes a great coalition from a regular coalition? And there are some things. The great coalitions start with trying to define the last mile. What will success look like? And only then do they go back and ask, what do we do next? The great coalitions figure out how to suppress egos, because egos are so destructive in organizations. The best organizations find a way for everyone to share in the products that are good so that everyone feels a part of that. The great coalitions have leaders that show both executive and congressional leadership. They know when to make a decision, but they know when to get everyone on board. And MAP has that kind of leadership. We've also learned to hire the right people. Well, that's easy to say. But I've watched as people are hired, and the procedure usually is to get a CV, then do an interview, then call a previous supervisor. Well, the fact is you never know why the previous supervisor is giving a good recommendation. And what I've found is what you are looking for in addition to what you find in the CV, you want someone that is a proven problem solver. You want someone that has shown sensitivity to other cultures. You want someone who comes to work optimistic, that doesn't ruin your day by being a pessimist. And the last summer I was at the Gates Foundation annual meeting and Bill Gates interviewed me for 30 minutes on, on stage. And his last question was, how do you maintain your optimism? And I said, by not hiring pessimists. 
I said, there's, there, there's a time when you need a pessimistic look at something, and when you need that, contract out for it, but don't hire those people. <laughs> I often talk to students interested in global health and I say, I can predict two things. You will never get rich and you'll probably never be thanked. But if you can get beyond those two, it's a really satisfying occupation. And I tell them about Pearl Kendrick, who practiced public health in Michigan in the 1930s and she developed the pertussis vaccine. When she died in 1979, the dean of the School of Public Health at the University of Michigan, a man by the name of Dick Remington, gave a eulogy and he said, there are hundreds of thousands of people who are alive because of Pearl Kendrick. And he paused and then he said, can you name one? He said, I can't either. But he said she was so satisfied in knowing she was doing the right thing, she didn't need people to thank her. She was confident in the decisions she was making. And that's what MAP can be looking forward to. They won't always be thanked. They're not going to get, get rich. But they can be sure that they're doing the right thing. Some other things that I've learned, that there are limits to science. People outside of science often think that scientists are so certain of what they're saying. And Richard Feynman, the physicist, said, certainty is the Achilles heel of science and religion and politics and medicine and on and on. So Voltaire said, doubt is not a pleasant condition, but certainty is absurd. Another thing we've learned, the power of science is not in its existence. The power of science is in its application. So there's something better than science, and that's science applied, and applied with a moral compass. Science in the service of equity, science in the service of the future. Rabelais, maybe 400 years ago, wrote 10 words that Will Durant said, these are 10 words to reckon with. He wrote, science without conscience is but the ruin of the soul. And I often think that should be in every science building around the country. We've also learned the need for optimism. There was a man by the name of Harlan Cleveland who was the ambassador to NATO from the United States in the 1960s. He became interested in global health late in life. And he was intrigued by it. And he finally wrote, the fuel for global health is unwarranted optimism. And I love that phrase, unwarranted optimism. But now, as we've been getting experience over the last decades, it's becoming more and more warranted. I've also learned to be a generalist and not just a specialist, but be a generalist and a specialist simultaneously. A theologian at Yale by the name of Pelican once said that where you got your education, who your mentors were, all leads to great science. But he said, if you want exceptional science, he said it depends on how much a person knows outside of their field. And so I tell students, learn as much as you can about the world and how, how it operates, then have a specialty to contribute, but now you know how it impacts on that world. William Penn, who was the great uh, leader of the Quakers, once said, to heal the world is true religion. That can be your goal. But there's an obligation to all of this. Einstein said, if we have the opportunity and the freedom to discover new things, then we have the obligation to use that information. And Primo Levi, who was a survivor at Auschwitz, I think that may have been his first book, in fact, was survival at Auschwitz, once wrote, if you know how to prevent torment and don't do it, then you become the tormentor. And that's not something we want to hear. Putting this all together, I end up saying that science 
in the words of Huxley, is simply common sense at its best. But then Durant asks the question about art and science, and he says the first scientist that we know in history by name is a man by the name of Imhotep. He was a physician in Egypt. He designed the Step Pyramid and built the Step Pyramid. And Will Durant said, isn't that a great thing to yearn after, even if you're the last person in history, to be both an artist and a scientist? But then 700 years ago, the Pope asked Roger Bacon to do a summary of science. And Roger Bacon attempted it, and it was so long, he was told the Pope will never read that. So he did a summary of the summary. He ended up doing a summary of the summary of the summary. <laughs> And it's been a long time since I last looked at that. But I can remember one of the things that he said to the Pope was, science has no moral compass. But he also said, science has great potential. And here's a man 700 years ago who predicted automobiles and airplanes and submarines and telescopes. Just a remarkable person. But then the third point that he made, and this was the one that convinces me the Pope never read his summary, was the church is doing nothing to help, that is to provide a moral compass. And I think if Roger Bacon would come back today and look at what we're doing, he would feel the same way. Science has no moral compass. We have to develop scientists with a moral compass. So he's looking at a moral compass. Now I put all of these together and say what we really are looking for is creative, ethical, common sense at its best. That is a great objective for us as individuals and for MAP. A final thought. James Thurber was a humorist of the last century, and the New York Times on the 100th anniversary of his birth, on December 8, 1994, had a long article about him, and they included the story of Thurber attending a reception. And a woman came up and introduced herself as being American. She said, I now live in Paris. And she said, they actually translate your articles into French. And she said, I think they're even funnier in French. And Thurber said, yes, they tend to lose something in the original. <laughs> so, Science loses something in the original. It has to be applied, and philanthropy has been a potent force in getting our science used for the benefit of the poor of the world, and MAP has been one of the servants in doing it, and I thank all of you for being part of it. Thank you.